for this pressure we applying. Tell my people rise up, can never be silenced. You think we're apologetic, I think we're defined. Mommy say I gotta be a go go get off. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abby. You've gotten a shout out in the chat uh, from Rama that they feel your music. Hello and welcome. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we're gonna give it a minute or so uh, to let people in and settle and um, get comfortable with the floor. As we do that, please take a minute to enter your name and where you're joining us from in the chat. Just say hello, your name, and where you're joining us from in the chat. We just wanna have a feel of the representation. Um, Heather from Cape Town, Aline, nice to see you again from Washington. Um, Joan Asimwe, I'm assuming you're joining us from Uganda. Eva, nice to see you again um, from Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, there's South Africa, there's Nairobi, there's Abuja. Uh, so we can see a representation of the common culprits from the continent. Gunther from Germany, nice to see you again. All right, Stella from Kenya. Nukulanga from Eswatini. So far, you are an outlier. Hello. Uh, Anthony from Nigeria. So you earlier, nice to see you again. Alrighty, uh, I can see Kenya, South Africa, Nigeria, Eswatini. Is there anyone from Rwanda? It's uh, interesting. Um, yes, Akua from Ghana, nice to see you. Uh, Joy from Zim, always fantastic to see people joining us from Zoom. Collins from Uganda. Karen from Goodwell, so that could be Nairobi, South Africa, or the Netherlands. Oh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name well. Lizian from Rwanda, and Akif, of course, from Rwanda. Um, and I, but in Ivory Coast. Okay, okay, fantastic. I, I, I sat too from Dakar. All right, thank you very much. Nice to see you all. Um. So today is a very special day for us at AVPA. If you joined us for the other major gathering we had this year in South Africa, the membership launch, I'm sure you noticed that we are unapologetically African and we're proudly so. So from the dress code to the supporting events, the Africanness, in our culture was quite clear or apparent. And if you've engaged with us again in other platforms, especially our webinars and our programs, I'm very sure that is very apparent that we're proudly African and um, we have faith and strong belief in this continent that we call home. As our CEO, Frank, likes to say, um, I'm gonna paraphrase, paraphrase it, Will it matter that you were born and raised on this continent? And by the way, that's his Twitter bio. So today, I'm sure therefore, it doesn't come as a surprise to most of you that we are launching a magazine whose main premise is to position the continent positively. And we, of course, call it the Africa Advantage. I am not going to go into details. If you've read some of our communications, you understand the basis of that title. But um, in a few, our CEO is going to come on and um, speak to that in detail. But in the meantime, um, we want to do a little bit of professional trivia. So my colleague, um, Abby is going to you know, share some uh, two, three questions in a slider format then I'm going to invite you to scan the QR code on the screen on your phone or enter the code that is gonna come up on slido.com to participate in the poll. Um, so let's see. 
So as I said, just go to slido.com, enter that code 32668059, or scan the QR code on the screen to participate in the um, upcoming call. Uh, poll. Sorry, it's gonna be a couple of minutes short, three questions. So we're gonna move through that quickly so that um, we can give way to today's major event. So how, what do you think, what is your perception of the perception of Africa in the global impact space? Your perception of the perception of Africa in the global impact space? Is it a net recipient contributor or is it equally a recipient and contributor? By equally, we mean like 50-50. Strong sentiments leading towards the net recipient so far. Wow, I'm curious. Um, if you voted net contributor, just one of you, can you unmute yourself and um, just justify your choice quickly? Anyone, if you voted net contributor, that's 5%. I'm assuming that would be one, two or three people. Um, you can just go ahead and mute yourself and explain the basis of your votes, if you don't mind. Okay, um, it seems like the majority in the room believes that it, um, Africa is perceived as a net recipient when it comes to impact. Again, I'm gonna quote our CEO again. Um, He's spoken vocally against uh, or encouraging Africa that we need to regard or perceive ourselves as sources of impact capital, not um, and not regard it as a as a foreign um, concept only. Okay, Abi, let's just go to the next one. Of these four sectors in Africa, which one do you think has the highest opportunity for job creation on the continent? If you believe there's another sector that um, holds that opportunity, but you have not mentioned it, uh, feel free to add it in the chat. Agriculture, so far leading. There's a creative sector, energy, and lastly, healthcare. So Eddie, Eddie one of our uh, contributors and panelists today, uh, you can see your sector has been voted as the highest opportunity for job creation on the continent. We're looking forward to that conversation when it comes to you speaking to the article you wrote for us. All right, thank you. Abby, let's go to the next one. So this one, um, just give us, you can give a range if you're not so sure about the specific number because it's unlikely to be a specific number. But how many, and don't Google, don't go to chat GPT or anywhere, just like off the top of your mind, how many trained health workers do you estimate will be needed globally by 2030 to address the projected deficit based on current trends? <laughs> Millions, 5 million, 20 million. All right, so 20 million is leading. 10 million, and there's 20 million, 1 billion, wow. So 20 and 1 seems to be the overwhelming response. Someone has written 2,000 nurses, okay? I can see some people still voting, so I'm gonna give it a couple of more seconds before we wrap it up. 25 million, 21, 15, I believe that's 20 million down there as well, 10. So averagely, I can see most people are playing between 10 and 20 or 10 and 25 million. Interesting. 
All right, we'll see how that plays out when we get into the conversation. Uh, thank you very much, Abby. And uh, once again, thank you very much for joining us for today's launch of the Africa Advantage um, and welcome. Without much further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Frank Aswani to speak to the basis and origin and um, how we view uh, the current magazine and how we're gonna uh, see its evolution going forward. Frank. Uh, thank you, Abu, and thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, my name is Frank Aswani, I'm the CEO at AVPA. Uh, so firstly, uh, we're really grateful for all of you who've made time to join us today. Uh, this is a real important milestone for us as AVPA um, due to the fact that we continue to not only build on the momentum of building the business case for Africa as a destination for impact uh, largely, but also uh, in this particular case, um, I think it's it's really important for us to ask ourselves what role do we play in the impact space as a continent? Are we just rule takers or are we also rule makers? What do we bring to this impact space that is uniquely African, that uh, has a value proposition that no one else can offer? And, and that is what speaks to the Africa advantage. Because too many times, um, I think in the global conversations and the circles that we operate in, we are seen as people who are always going to ask, but not people who've got something to give. And that's something I strongly disagree with. Uh, so the purpose of this magazine is really to bring to the fore and center of impact conversations globally, the Africa advantage. What do we bring to the con to the global impact space? What do we have that no one else can offer? How is why is it that impact players globally have to actually uh, look at Africa as an ideal destination for impact capital? Why is it that Africa should be central to impact conversations globally? All those are the kind of questions we want to unpack. But I think, as you would imagine, uh, unless we are deliberate about taking some of these opportunities and making them very clear, visible, and audible to the global impact community, none of these are going to be seen as things that people should be pursuing. So what we do intend to uh, achieve uh, with this magazine is to really highlight uh, impact opportunities on the continent, especially those that are uniquely African. Uh, and it's all in line uh, with our mission of, of mobilizing and increasing the flow of capital towards the impact of the continent. So all of this is towards creating and showcasing impact investment opportunities in Africa. Um, this magazine is not an ABP magazine. It's a network magazine. You're all playing in the impact spaces across the continent. You're all seeing opportunities that we think the global impact investment investors and uh, investment community especially has to, to hear about um, things that they probably would not normally get to know about. Uh, this is a magazine that we are giving you an opportunity to showcase and talk about these opportunities. And we shall be very deliberate to, to, uh, to offer people opportunities to co-curate articles uh, for, 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 this, for this magazine going forward. Uh, this is the first of uh, many editions to come. Uh, and in this first edition, we are going to be featuring six uh, articles. Uh, we're really pleased and grateful to the contributors to this first edition who are with, with us today. Uh, but see this as a magazine for you to showcase the opportunities on the continent. You know these opportunities better than we do. Uh, we are basically trying to provide a platform to magnify what you're seeing on the ground. And what we can do is then try and see how to get more investors to, to view these opportunities favorably. So uh, there's a lot of exciting stuff we, we are going to discuss today uh, and in many days to come with the plans we have for this magazine. It's more than just a magazine. It's a platform of conversation, engagement, and uh, opportunities, uh, kind of qualification that would enable us ultimately to mobilize capital for impact on the continent. We'll speak a bit more to that um, uh, and before I close, I really would like to first of all say a big thanks to the contributors behind this magazine, the people who uh, took time to write us articles uh, for this magazine. Uh, and I do, uh, some of us, are, some of them are with us today, but Ojoma Chai from Nigeria, thank you very much. Diana, Akif, uh, Eddie, Kuria, and Dr. Gidinji, uh, we're really, really grateful. This is something which you took a leap of faith in and you saw our vision and you've come with us. 
I'd also like to thank uh, my team members, uh, specifically Abu, uh, who, who's just been the guy hosting. He didn't introduce himself. But this idea actually came uh, from Abu. Um, and the, the rest of the team then piggybacked on this to bring it to where it is today. Uh, Zach, who's going to be hosting you, has been pivotal in making sure this happened. Abby has also been really critical in making sure that we stay on course. Uh, and the rest of the team in the background who have been really pivotal in this. So uh, without further ado, back to you, uh, Abu, but we're super excited to be here today. And I'm really looking forward to not just what this magazine will do for us now, but will do for the content in the longer term. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, so as you said, it's it's a, an ecosystem magazine. It's an ecosystem platform. And um, without much further ado, I'd like to hand this over to my colleague, Zach, to um, take us through 40 minutes of or so of a conversation with our fantastic contributors. Zach. Oh, thank you very much, Abu. And of course, to all the participants who have joined us today in this very significant day when we get to launch the Africa Advantage magazine. And so for this session, we would just go straight to our panelists who have joined us today. And of course, the panelists that we have, and you, as you can see them on the screen, they are also the contributors for the magazine. So I'll take the opportunity uh, to go ahead and introduce the panelists. And for each panelist, you can take at least two minutes to tell us more about yourself, what you do, and quickly why you joined this initiative. So I'll basically start with uh, Diana. Diana, over to you. All right, thank you, Zach. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. It's uh, quite sunny here in Ghana, even though it's uh, just 10 to uh, noon here. So my name is Diana, I work with Tafa Business Advisory is a management consulting firm in Ghana. And I have been very passionate about impact investing, especially when I started working with an investment banking firm. I used to write a lot of articles around it. And so that's a bit about me. So interested in philanthropy, entrepreneurship, research, and then impact investing. Thank you, Zach. Oh, thanks a lot, Diana. Welcome all the way from Ghana. I'll move on to Akif Merchant. Akif, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Zach. Um, my name is Akif. Uh, I'm based in Rwanda. I'm an associate director at Convergence Blended Finance, leading all of our work um, in and across the continent. Uh, and I'm here with all of you today um, because I passionately believe um, that narratives and perceptions matter. Um, and this particular magazine is looking to change the narrative and change the perception, as all of you just alluded to earlier, uh, with respect to the potential for impact investment uh, and innovative finance across the continent. And so really, really happy to be here with all of you today. Uh, and kudos to the AVPA team uh, for organizing this event um, and for publishing the magazine. I know a lot of hard work has gone into this, so congratulations. Thank you very much, Akif, and welcome. And then I'll pass it over to Eddie. Uh, thank you so much, Zach. Um, my name is uh, Eddie Sembacha. I'm the CEO and founder of Finding XY. I'm very passionate about entrepreneurship and MSMEs in, in Africa and how they can uh, be supported. I have uh, 16, 16 years experience uh, working in this field, looking at impact investment and economic investment. Uh, Finding XY itself is, uh, is an innovation center that is registered in Uganda and in Kenya, East Africa. And we are very passionate about how we can create solutions for the continent center entrepreneurs. So very happy about this opportunity and what the magazine has to offer the continent. Oh, thank you very much, Eddie. So that's Eddie from Uganda. I'll move on to Kuria. Kuria, are you here with us? Yes, I am, Ed, uh, Zach. Thanks very much. Hello, everyone. 
My name is Kuria Wanjao. I work with FSD Africa. Um, now turning 10 years um, this year, actually. Uh, and uh, our program is uh, funded by uh, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, that's FCDO of the UK government. And our mandate is basically to make finance work for Africa's future. Uh, and uh, it's it's quite a broad mandate. And so we are looking at the entire continent and how to uh, drive financial services and financial intermediation uh, in the African continent. And most importantly, how we can drive um, capital into the sectors that really matter. Um, we are looking to do a lot on, on, on climate change, uh, among other things. And um, I'm currently working as a manager with um, with the digital innovations team. And so trying to look at how uh, we can employ technology to solve some of Africa's financial problems. So thanks very much to the AVPA team, Zach and your entire crew uh, on giving us a chance and a platform to share our experience on the work that we've done on refugee financial inclusion and impact investing therein. And just to mention as I close that uh, Within FSD Africa, we do provide um, uh, support to the financial sector, but uh, we also have uh, a sister organization called FSD Africa Investments that actually does investment in some of uh, the more nascent and uh, uh, innovative uh, uh, finance uh, circles. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Eddie. And of course, I'll just move straight into quick questions because I don't want to hold us off from the magazine. It's really awesome. Uh, we have it ready. So we'll just go quickly through the panel discussions. And after that, we will go straight into the launch. So the first question that I want to ask, we'll go to Diana Tsitsiu. Diana, in the magazine, you did a piece on uh, healthcare investing and in, in, impact investing within the healthcare sector. So my question to you is that from your perspective, briefly, what are the untapped opportunities that you see Africa has within this uh, sector? All right, Zach, thank you again. Um, I must say that the magazine is awesome. I can't wait for everybody to get a copy and to read them. Um, the various perspectives, I mean, the various industries that were looked at. So thanks once again to ABK and the team. So as Zach said, I wrote on the healthcare industry. And um, for me, there are a lot of untapped opportunities for Africa. Because looking at what impact investing stands for, uh, trying to align financial returns with impact. So. Uh, some of the opportunities are in terms of infrastructure development. So um, the continent, in terms of its infrastructure towards healthcare, it's not at the level that it ought to be. So there's an opportunity for impact investment towards infrastructure. And also when it comes to learning and development, there's also that aspect, the training aspect where um, I like the question that was asked in the post about how many people will be needed uh, to be able to cater for a healthcare need. And some said 20 million and 25 and the likes. It means that um, as our numbers and population grow, there's, there'll still be a need for healthcare workers and not just any healthcare workers. So there's an opportunity to train, more training for our healthcare workers. Another uh, on top opportunity too is in terms of uh, disease prevention and management. So already we've seen some initiative stores that uh, we look at various vaccination programs that are going on. And uh, even with the novel vaccine towards malaria, that there has also been that. Whilst we load all these initiatives, we still believe they are, there's a lot of room for more, more of such like initiatives. And um, I, I, it would be incomplete for me to not talk about technology. There's also the aspect of technology. So we see there have been some advancement, telemedicine, we have M-Pharma, 
where now you could just go to the pharmacy and also have consultation at the same time. So I believe these are some of the on top opportunities as it pertains to the healthcare industry in Africa. Uh, thank you very much, Diana, for the brief on the opportunities that you captured in your contribution. I'll just run quickly to Akif, who did a piece on blended finance. And of course, Akif, the question to you is that, you know, being someone who's been within the financial sector for some time, how does blended finance serve, serve as a catalyst for unlocking Africa's economic potential? So in your view, how what is the role of blended finance in this? Great, thanks, Zach. Um, maybe some facts here before before we move on. Uh, number one is that you know Africa needs around 140, uh, 194 um, billion dollars annually um, in financing to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, to meet the Paris targets, Africa needs a cumulative amount of two point eight trillion dollars with a T by twenty thirty. Um, if you look at the continent's public debt as an example, stood at around $1.8 trillion uh, as of 2020. Um, and official development assistance, which is all of the monies from the various different donor governments, is flatlining at around 208 to $210 billion. So where do we get this capital from to unleash the potential in the various sectors that we spoke about earlier, be it agriculture, energy, health, and so on. We have no other choice but to tap and mobilize all of this capital that is sitting with the private sector. Now, when I mention the private sector, it's important for me to underscore that we mean private sector within Africa, but also private sector and commercial sector internationally as well. Oftentimes when we have this conversation, we, we always forget that there is so much untapped potential within our pension funds, and high net with individual and impact investors based here in Africa. So that's important to, uh, to, to, to state at the outset. Now, when these private investors are looking to make investment decisions, whether we like it or not, risk and return is the paradigm along which they make investment decisions. And as we know, there's a perception of risk in Africa, but there's also a huge challenge around the real risk in Africa. So when these folks are looking to make investments, either the risk is too high, or the return is not oftentimes commensurate um, with this risk. And this is really where blended finance comes in because blended finance is nothing more or nothing less than a financial structuring approach, either to shift or mitigate risks or to enhance returns such that we can mobilize and catalyze all of this private sector capital um, that is being invested in government bonds um, or in traditional uh, investment mechanisms to the various impact investments and to the various geographies and to the various sectors that we all care about. So that's really where I see the role of blended finance um, in terms of mobilizing all of this capital towards development impact in Africa. Thanks, Akif, for a very, very comprehensive response. And I believe that you know the, all the participants, if you have any questions, just note them down. We'll be able to get back to you once uh, we are done with the introductory sessions. Of course, I'll move over to you, Kuria. And of course, Kuria, you did an article on financial inclusion. Basically, this was a reflection of your experience, you know, with the within the humanitarian sector, and of course, your efforts to provide them access to digital financial solutions. So, my quick question to you, which is almost close to Akif's, is that what potential do you see for impact investing to improve financial inclusion for marginalized people like the refugee communities across Africa? Thanks, uh, uh, Zach, Zach, for that question. Um, just uh, as a way of background, um, our, our engagement with the refugee population was informed by the realization that uh, refugees are among the, the, the most uh, excluded from financial services. Um, and to Akif's point, part of it is that they are considered, number one, very risky, but number two, um, 
extremely mobile. And so um, they may be here today and gone tomorrow. But I think experience has shown us um, over time that refugees are actually staying longer in their host countries than previously intended or, um, or previously thought. And so our initiative was basically to bring in, and, and to Akif's point again, to bring in private sector to provide uh, financial services on a sustainable basis uh, to the refugee population. And I wanted to capture this much more broadly from the perspective of not just refugees, but uh, fragile communities, because in our context, when we look at refugees, it's one segment of the market, but even within our different geographies, we have vulnerable communities that are viewed just with the same lens by financial service providers as refugees are. And so um, in, in our case, uh, we, we, we kind of brought in um, very patient grant money um, uh, to nudge financial service providers to engage their money. Uh, and just to correct that, uh, we did not provide the funding for these institutions to provide service savings or, or loan facilities. They used their, their own, own money. And um, for those that were able to give credit, um, yes, we did provide um, um, a guarantee scheme which they could could back back uh, could which they could rely on as they advanced uh, loans, for example, to refugees. But um, at the end of the, the 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 pilot that we were conducting with them, none of them actually uh, dipped the into that guarantee fund because these refugees were able to uh, for, for service their loans um, from the different economic activities that they were engaging, and so it, for us we we like drawing this, and I, I have to say as I make my comments that we did this in collaboration with our sister FSD organizations in Uganda and with FSD Uganda and in Rwanda with um, uh, access to finance Rwanda. And so one of the things that um, that we saw uh, help a lot in terms of delivery of, of the financial services was use of, of digital platforms and especially uh, mobile money, but also in, in the case of Rwanda, use of uh, development of a USSD uh, platform that then the refugees could use with any um, a phone that they that, that they had access to. But in, to your uh, question, Zachary, we see a huge opportunity um, in terms of investing, especially for vulnerable communities or even fragile communities, um, as 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 a way in which they can be improved on. And so. Uh, loans is one thing, savings is another, uh, and among others also looking at some of the more widely used uh, models like the village savings and, and credit uh, schemes, which are very common with most African communities. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Kuria. And as you can see, even in the comment section, uh, uh, Duarugira is in agreement uh, with the plight of the disadvantaged communities, which of course you've clearly explained goes beyond refugees, but the plight of refugees is uh, very considerable. And I believe there's a need for ecosystem players like ourselves to put more emphasis on this and create opportunities for them. I'll come back to you later, Kuria, and of course, Akif as well, because there's an interesting question that Antonio has asked, which I believe is addressed to Akif. And as well, there's a question from Joy, Diana. I believe this is addressed to you as well. So I'll uh, move on to Eddie. Eddie, of course, you did a piece on agriculture, positioning Africa as a food basket, and of course, the role of impact investing in this. So I would just like to ask you a quick question. Based on your experience within the impact uh, sector, do you have any uh, success story from your work that you can share with us, which is of impact investing in nature that has significantly advanced agricultural development? This can be any success story from Uganda or anywhere else across Africa. Over to you, Eddie. Uh, thanks, thanks, Doug. Um, 
let, 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 let me start with what wasn't successful. I, I think I, I uh, about three months back, I, I came across an article that was saying that investing in agriculture in Africa is not profitable. And uh, this came from one, one of our impact investors. And as I read that, I, I was wondering if the person who's writing this is actually snacking on something or is eating something because we don't need agriculture um, uh, in a sense for our survival. So, and and I could get where they were coming from uh, because there are so many hidden costs when it comes to investing in agriculture. And one of the things I've kept on saying is that um, impact investment is fast becoming a details question. We need details. We need to see impact investors getting closer to the markets where they're investing so that there is better understanding of those market dynamics and projections in as far as the returns are going to be concerned and how to navigate the, the challenges that are in. Uh, at Finding XY, we have designed uh, two projects that are looking at agriculture that we really want to scale across the continent. That is the, the Women in Agriculture Impact Investment Facility, which is a blended finance facility that is providing both debt, uh, investor matching services, and a business advisory to uh, female-led agribusinesses. So the other perspective is to increase uh, the level of women's participation in agricultural success. And we launched this in Uganda with the uh, support of the American people through USID. And uh, since we launched it, we've seen a number of transactions, but most of these have been debt transactions. And there have been lots of learnings as well in as far as trade is concerned and how to better support African businesses to take advantage of trading opportunities on the continent and now with AFTA, uh, with the Africa Free Continental Trade Area coming in place, how to take advantage of the opportunities that are being uh, offered uh, in the different uh, neighboring countries. And that is really still something that has to be worked upon. There's a lot of progress in that area, in that direction, but we're also working with the portfolio companies. We have about 160 uh, portfolio companies right now on how to really promote that. The other project is what we've called the Agricultural Apprentice Incubator. And this speaks to the refugee communities. Here we have designed um, a, a program that is providing both seed capital and capacity development to agri SMEs to work in refugee communities or vulnerable communities. And this is structured by them taking on board the refugees as apprentices that are going to provide trade services to them. That is either the supply or offtake of agricultural produce and we provide seed capital to such refugees. And we have seen very incredible transactions already happening between agri SMEs and refugees in the communities. Um, it's very promising. It's different from the perspective that we had uh, when we started the project. Um, we were very skeptical if any trade transactions will actually happen. Uh, but a lot of trade has actually happened already. And since we've launched this now for into uh, four months now, but already we have over five tons of uh, agricultural produce are being traded in a very short window, I think of one month. So we are very uh, happy that this is actually making sense because for us, that is one of the way we can really push up to support different uh, refugee communities in using a market-based uh, system. But all in all, um, for us, it's, it's important that we get the details in the markets while we're operating so that we can tailor solutions that actually speak to the gaps 
but they can also give us the returns that we want on the investments that we make. Thanks a lot, Eddie, for sharing those cases with us. And uh, I'll just go straight into the comment section uh, to address some of the questions that have been raised so far by the participants. And uh, the first one, of course, as I mentioned, Akif, would you please respond to the point that has been raised by Antonio on, uh, you know, the current geopolitical issues around the world and uh, focus on African countries beyond Africa in terms of, you know, the potential for blended finance? I hope you've seen it more clearly. Please respond to it. Yeah, so... From the data that we have, that we've looked at around 1,200 odd transactions. Um, first of all, as I mentioned in the article as well, around 48% of those transactions have taken place in Africa, as compared to Latin America, as compared to Asia, um, or as compared to even, even Central and Eastern Europe. Um, now, when we look at from that subsection of 48%, um, which countries are we seeing most of these blended transactions take place in? Um, of course, for a variety of different reasons, real or perceived, it's no surprises for guessing, um, that East African countries, Kenya, Tanzania, um, Rwanda, Uganda, um, rank favorably in terms of uh, deal numbers. Um, having said that, um, there is, I think, and I believe a recognition amongst the more concessional capital providers be they donor agencies or foundations, um, that we need to change the economic center of gravity and we need to get more deals done in Central Africa or Western Africa. Now, as you all know, Central Africa and in Western Africa is when we have a much, much higher perception of risk and real risk as well. And so you will need a lot more concessionality to draw in and to mobilize um, the private sector in these particular regions, especially if you're talking about um, any of the Sahel regions um, which, as we all know, there's many, many geopolitical tensions and issues um, across the Sahel Belt. Um, now, when it comes to sectors, um, sectors that lend themselves well to blended finance are sectors that have underlying cash flows that can pay back investors, because by definition, we're looking to mobilize the private sector, uh, and therefore we, uh, there is a return expectation. Um, and so sectors such as SME financing through supporting the banks, um, renewable energy, um, agribusiness um, are the three sectors and even infrastructure as well are the three to four sectors where we see most of the, is these deals taking place. Um, let's take a look at adaptation, for example. There's a lot been said and there's a lot of literature out there with respect to the, the needs for adaptation, uh, again, specifically in a continent like ours. Now, when you think of adaptation, when you think of mangrove restoration um, or putting up a dry seawall or any other adaptation uh, measures, there are not that many identifiable cash flows that are associated with these kind of uh, these kind of activities. Um, and so, as I mentioned again, blended finance lends itself well to sectors that have underlying cash flows um, and not so well to sectors such as adaptation um, that might traditionally need to be served um, by grants so you can build an ecotourism model and so on and so forth. But from a scale perspective, we haven't seen that as yet. Um, another issue when, come, when talking about health or education is a lot of the deals in the health and education space are small. If we're talking about mobilizing private capital at scale, we need to have larger deal sizes. And so you haven't seen too much work or too many investments in the, in the education and, and health spaces because traditionally both these sectors have been the domain of the public sector. Uh, and so, you know, you don't have too many business models in the space. And even the opportunities in the business models you have those investment opportunities are just too small and the transaction costs are just too high for larger commercial investors uh, to be interested in as compared to uh, smaller niche impact investors. Uh, thanks a lot, Kafi. Uh, Akif, on, you really stressed on the importance of having, you know, uh, deals that have you know, proper underlying cash flow. And of course, you've also uh, stressed on the need for the investment opportunity to be large enough to be considered for this uh, type of financing. Another question 
that probably would go to right now is to Diana. Diana, Joy asked a question on the subject of health and uh, she's talking about, you know, the plight of the care caregivers and uh, primary health workers who often work with us, especially uh, within our communities and their work often goes unrecognized. So what sort of investment are we putting into this space? All right. Um, Joy, that was a very good observation. And um, for me, Zach asked the question earlier. I think I skipped it about uh, the reason why I wanted to contribute to the magazine, particularly uh, choosing the healthcare. So I have a lot of relatives who work in the healthcare sector here in Ghana, even though I'm not a health care worker. And I've seen firsthand experience uh, some of the rules they've had to go through whilst like delivering on their jobs, which includes what joy you have um, mentioned, how they have to work extra hours which are not recognized. And then there's also the aspect of if they are able to receive adequate training and all that. So for me, um, this is what I think. And some of the, what I've also observed, the, some of the things that make it challenging for them to execute their work is one, accessibility and resources. Fortunately, in terms of resources, there are programs that are, have come. We talk about the Novartis Access Program, which is right now rendering essential medicines um, at very affordable cost. And then there's also the issue about accessibility. Again, uh, we have Zipline in Ghana, for instance, we have Zipline delivering essential medical supplies to remote places in Ghana. That's like, the workers do not have to go through lens to be able to get essential blood samples or results delivered to them or even essential like things they need in delivering their job. So there's that. And then there's also an introduction of e-scooters, which has also helped to transport these workers to uh, remote areas of work, which they ordinarily would not have gone to. So these uh, initiatives that have come up have come to like make their work a bit easy to be able to deliver. That's, that does it. And then also there's a unique program I read about recently by M Pharma. So we understand that in Africa, the government showed us a lot of the responsibility when it comes to uh, healthcare. I mean, over here in Ghana, that's the case. And we have, we, it's just recently that we are seeing more private investment towards the medical care sector. So. An example is M Pharma. So M Pharma recently wants to roll a program for like pharmacies. So they are going to select various pharmacies and enroll them in a community program where they will be paid stipends and they'll be given various stuff. So then this takes the burden from the government of having to absorb these health workers. Now we have the private people coming in to absorb these health workers, paying them good stipends to encourage them to go about and deliver quality health care. Yes, I hope that has answered your perspective. Thank you very much, Dan. Of course, I believe, Joy, if you're satisfied with the response, good. If you have further questions, feel, please feel free to reach out to Diana. She's uh, quite responsive. But then just a follow-up on your response, Diana. More than often, we have these placement companies that uh, give opportunities to young nurses, especially in Africa, and they are placed either in Canada, the US, or Europe. And uh, of course, most of these young nurses have been uh, trained through government subsidized uh, institutions until okay. the point where they've graduated. So the placement companies come uh, puts them through the process and they are given opportunities, for example, in the U.S., where once they get these jobs, there's a certain segment of their salary that is, uh, you know, is paid to the placement company. And uh, basically, the only form of benefit that I believe a country, for instance, Kenya, would gain from this scheme would be in form of the remittances. So, of course, your response was more focused on local-based uh, 
you know, uh, uh, examples. But for this situation where young nurses are living in troughs and going abroad, what, how, how can we benefit more from this as Africans? Okay, so that's, that's also another good observation. I mean, even here in Ghana, uh, the Nurses Association have reported a lot of nurses like going abroad to such destinations, the US, the UK, and other aspects of Europe. So there's um, the solution to this is that it will continue to happen. That's the point. Like they will still be lured with this incentive, but the government can come in and have like structured processes around it. So for instance, Ghana recently had an arrangement with uh, one of the North American countries where we officially gave out some number of nurses to go and work there, signed an agreement for a period of time. And then after they're able to give back, they come back and serve the country. So then through that agreement, the government gets to benefit because there will be some uh, financial commitments involved where the country gets to like benefit from it. So I think that's where the government should take the approach. Various African countries, and uh, the government should take that approach. They should try and formalize agreements in, in those areas because obviously they won't be able to absorb all the healthcare workers that come out every year. So instead of allowing other companies come and push them, why don't you uh, formalize agreements with nations that would need it and then you can benefit from some returns and even have your workers coming back to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Diana, for that response. Very articulate. I'll uh, go quickly to Eddie. Eddie, you responded on the case study that you gave us. It was more of a women-focused intervention. And we've seen a lot of this across Africa where there's a, a preference either for youth-led intervention or women-led interventions in the programs that we are pursuing. Is there a risk in this approach and is there a point where we need to stop or should we continue with this kind of approach? <laughs> What's your take on it? You can see the question in the chat. Yeah, uh, I see a question. Thanks, sir. Um, no, we don't need to stop uh, for a start because the, the need is there. Um, I, I was raised by, by my mother and she taught me how to be an entrepreneur at an early age of 14. Uh, she would send us out. I think my first job she gave me was to sell eucalyptus, eucalyptus, eucalyptus trees uh, that had been cut down. And I had to go around uh, looking for buyers of these logs. Uh, and for me, it was development and she did this while not very educated. So for me, the, the, that is a subject that I'm personally also passionate about because I know the role that women play in societies like Africa, you know, and I'm sure most of us here can attest to that, that uh, women play a critical role in raising generations of young leaders that can transform uh, the society. So the need is there. And when I look across our portfolio companies, there are so many female owned businesses, but they're very small. Sometimes when we go into uh, deal closures, uh, deal closure meetings that investors come in to meet with the uh, founders of these companies, and we ask, uh, because one of the aspects we look at, we will look at equity. So when we are saying women in agriculture, we're not saying only women, we're saying that you should have at least 30% female representation in your company. And uh, the rest can be male. So male, male is, we still work with men, but when they come, when quick examples is when they come into these board meetings or these investor meetings, uh, you, you notice it's only the men talking. And the women usually, you know, she can get up and self tea around. She's she's usually the nice person in in the room to um, make sure everyone is fine. So for me, those things when you observe them, it mm -hmm. just it make, gives you uh, places the emphasis of why we need to work with women. When it comes to youth, that's even a bigger problem because 
So we're, we're, we're at 60% youth uh, currently in, in Africa. So you see a very huge gap and also an opportunity in how to create these opportunities for young people, especially through the creative sector and coming up with models that work. So to quickly summarize and respond to that question that it's a trend and it's a mega trend. Um, we, if, we, if we invest business as usual, we'll still be creating a problem. If we don't be intentional of bringing women on the table and making sure they're making a significant contribution because yeah. at the end of the day, it has an impact on family, on communities, on the young people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eddie, for, of course, stressing on the African youth dividend. So it is not just a matter of feel-good uh, exercise that we do, but Africa is a very young continent with a lot of youth, which has so much to offer. And so definitely these interventions, we have to ensure that it's designed to at least capitalize on this and as one of the advantage that we have as a continent. Thank you. So I'll move on quickly to Korea and then we'll have a last round of question. Korea, uh, quickly. So what are some of the key action you'd recommend to change the narrative and uh, highlight Africa as a, a, a destination you know, for impact investing based on your experience. Uh, thank, thank you, Zach. And, and I actually wanted to just add to the point that Eddie was was Ray, was addressing about women and youth. Um, and uh, more recently, we 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 have been looking at opportunities to invest in uh, in startups and. Uh, Unless you're very deliberate in terms of selecting out um, both women, women-led uh, startups or um, and, and youth-led uh, innovations, you can very easily um, miss the mark. And so, um, just encouraging women to kind of be more um, out upcoming in terms of, um, of of impact investing is 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 a really important thing. It's not just within the agriculture space, but even within the innovation ecosystem, um, just identifying and supporting uh, women-led um, either startups or enterprises is, is a key thing. Um, now, in terms of your questions about uh, key actions to change the narrative, I think one of the uh, uh, methods that we have adopted um, in order to start addressing or changing the narrative is to uh, being very deliberate or playing a part in, in, in de-risking uh, some of the initiatives uh, that are being uh, undertaken by African enterprises. And so we we have a, ve a very uh, big mandate in terms of uh, driving um, financial markets to and especially capital to, um, to towards innovation. So innovation is one of the things that we are really looking to support. But more importantly than that is how do we de-risk um, again to a key point? How do you uh, reduce the risk and how do you bring in uh, a blended form of finance to um, to the to the to the game so that then you are also making a case and so we uh, have been engaged as FSD Africa in what we are calling demonstration deals and um, we we go in as uh, uh, fast investors and with the hope of um, making a case or showing. Uh, the market that indeed this is a viable uh, business opportunity and supporting these initiatives in terms of uh, being the first uh, people that are investing. However, uh, given the, the sums that Akif mentioned, this is merely in our, in our view, uh, a drop in the ocean. And so we need to kind of crowd in more, uh, more private capital and, and, and really just to open this um, fine we are talking about african markets but in the in 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 the scheme in the grand scope of things scope of things um capital basically moves where there is opportunity so it's not um lost on us that yes we through this demonstration cases that we are making 
then capital will, will be able to attract other investors into some of the initiatives that we are supporting. And we are increasingly uh, supporting climate smart or um, uh, initiatives that are addressing climate change, given the impact that that is having on the on, on the globe and the fact that Africa is is one is suffering disproportionately um, more from climate change than the rest of the world. And so, a lot of the initiatives that we are currently investing or or working on are looking at how do we start addressing the impacts of climate change, whether it's through the carbon market um, initiative or, 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 um, or mangrove or forest reforestation, uh, as well as uh, looking at um, in, uh, innovations um, uh, that are coming up in Africa and how can we support those innovations to basically grow uh, to become a formidable uh, case. Over. Uh, th thanks a lot, Kuria. Very comprehensive. To Akif, to you very briefly, in your opinion, how can we reshape the narrative? Yeah, so in terms of reshaping the narratives, uh, a few different suggestions are over here. Um, one is we need to put a lot of emphasis and a lot of pressure, as you and, and Frank at the outset rightfully mentioned, in terms of Africa becoming a net contributor to the impact story. Um, what do I mean by that? Um, we've seen this tremendous amount of, of pension and insurance and institutional capital sitting right here on the continent. Uh, in Kenya, you have the Kenyan Pension Fund Investment Consortium. Um, all of those pension funds in Kenya now have moved from traditionally only buying government paper to now investing in infrastructure assets as an asset class because infrastructure has a multiplier effect on the economy. I have a tremendous amount of respect um, for the Rwanda Social Security Investment Board, our very own pension fund in Rwanda, because they're one of the few pension funds that I'm aware of on the continent that is making um, equity investments into funds or doing direct deals into startups. That is very, very unique. Um, and oftentimes they are pulling in other forms of capital with them as well. Um, so number one is we really need to get our own pension funds in our own countries um, to start mobilizing uh, some of this capital. Um, the second thing that I wanted to mention is uh, that we really need to put a lot of pressure on our country and national governments um, to put some skin in the game. We can't only be asking for some of this funding from the official development creditors. We have money within our own countries and we need our countries to, to put some skin in the game, whether that is with some limited amount of concessional capital that provides a signal to other donors um, that these countries are serious um, and are also thinking about uh, mobilizing capital. Um, the last point I wanted to make is, is around creating a more benign enabling environment. And again, this is for all of us as impact practitioners um, to apply pressure uh, from, for, for our own governments to, to do some of this. I'll give you an example. Um, in Ethiopia, the minimum investment size for foreign investors is around $150,000 to invest in, in, in any startup or in any SME in Ethiopia. We can spend uh, a long, long time in Ethiopia, but we all know that there's not that many startups or SMEs in Ethiopia that have the absorptive capacity to, to take in $150,000. And when I speak to the Ethiopian government, and the idea is, you know, we don't want our assets to be owned by, by foreign organizations. And I totally understand that. But that's a conversation to happen when you have sufficient scale. So there are many rules, many regulations that just don't make any sense that preclude uh, a lot of foreign investors or domestic investors from supporting the impact ecosystem. And so we really need to, to, to double down um, as, impact, uh, uh, as impact, as an impact community, to put pressure on our government. So a lot of uh, government change and enabling environment, um, getting more domestic capital from high net worth individuals as well, because there's a lot of high net worth individuals in South Africa, in Nigeria, in Kenya that can support this. Um, and also uh, governments uh, within our countries also putting some concessional capital and some skin in the game as well. That's how I think we can really change the narrative uh, and, and create a ripple effect. Thanks a lot, Aki, for those three points on uh, focus on an enabling environment uh, with the a working regulatory uh, in, uh, framework, as well as you know, capitalizing on domestic capital, invest in what we have, and of course, concessions from the government. 
at AVPA actually <laughs> we have a huge focus on domestic capital. We believe that, for instance, faith-based investing, there's a lot that our churches have that we just need to tap into uh, to achieve the impact that we really seek. I see Zana Tool has, his, has, has raised their hands. Do you have a question? Okay. I suppose that was an accident. Okay, I'll move. I'll move over to Hi, Eddie. As, yes, yes. Awesome. Hi, I just wanted to make just two quick comments, but uh, if yes, that yes. interrupts your flow, I can come back later. No, 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 it's okay. Go ahead, please. All right. Thank you so much. First of all, a big, big congratulations on this magazine. I think it's very timely and extremely relevant. I just wanted to pick up on the cue around reshaping the narrative. Um, I'm Zanath. I'm based in South Africa. I work for a advisory firm that uh, we advise donors, DFIs around improving the sustainability and scale of impact. So I think the the reason I'm congratulating you all is the timeliness of it and the role the magazine can really play in reshaping the narrative. I think when you think about invest investing in Africa, there's always that immediate impression that we are talking about vulnerable groups, whereas in Africa being such a huge economy, um, and thanks to Aki for the fantastic stats, being a huge economy, there is a diverse set of investments. You have healthcare, you have women, you have the SaaS that are, you know, very popular investment uh, portfolios across the globe. But I think it's very hard on a practical level for investors to get that view, get that picture, because most of the investors are not in Africa. They are sitting somewhere else. So I think the magazine can play a really good role in sort of highlighting some of these opportunities on country basis. I'm obviously not sure how the structure works, but if there is a way for the magazine to sort of give use the magazine as a platform to highlight local investment opportunities, I think that'll be really interesting so that all foreign investment doesn't come to the five or 10 companies in every country that is getting investment from you know 10 or 20 investors. There's a diversity. Um, and that being said, the second word is also sort of educating the ecosystem in terms of appreciating the differences between the context. There is again a tendency of sort of thinking there's one formula that's going to fit all the countries and the continent as a whole, which is not the case. So all the fantastic examples that you have shared and the panelists have shared, following from the same sort of hypothesis, using the magazine as a platform to discuss the context and the differences in how to invest in the different regions in Africa. I've spent quite a lot of night time in Nigeria. Nigeria is very different from the context in South Africa. Same with Uganda. So I'm highlighting this contextual variations and how investors need to act differently to be able yeah. to invest in the right way. I think that would be fantastic. Okay. So I'm really okay. looking forward to seeing the magazine and what comes off it. But a big congratulations to you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Akif, seems like you have a quick... Uh, yeah, I just wanted to make... To I, I just wanted to make a quick point, and it would be great if the magazine going forward can focus on this or if we can also sort of put this into the mix, which is around governance. We can have discussions all day about mobilizing private capital and having the best accelerator programs and so on. But until, until and unless we fix the governance issues, which is in our hands to fix, first of all, in our own countries, we are never going to see uh, this narrative change. South Africa and Nigeria should be the drivers of change uh, on this continent. We all know what's going on in South Africa and Nigeria. Through complete corruption and mismanagement, these countries are taking three steps back. It's countries where, with, with good governance um, that are really, really taking the, this baton forward, like Rwanda as an example. Um, and so that's really what we need to see on this continent as well. And that's also within our powers to change because ultimately the government comes from all of us. So if we can have a discussion on good governance and how do we you know, work within with, with governments as well, um, I think that's really, really important as well. And that's an important element in, in this discussion. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Akif, for highlighting the important role that governance playing in building an enabling environment for impact investing. Very, very important. And I think this is an approach that we we'll have to include as we attempt to, you know, present these opportunities that are within the continent and the role of governance in them. So as we conclude, I'm about to welcome Frank to 
launch the magazine officially. But before I do so, in one minute, Diana, give us your closing uh, comment, the same as Kuria and Eddie, then I'll welcome Frank to launch the magazine for us. Okay, Zach, I think I'll go first. So I saw uh, Joy had a follow-up uh, comment in the section where she talked about uh, remuneration being a great concern for the reason why some of these nurses tend to go abroad. And I agree, it's, it's a very important factor. But then again, I think there are also other issues which uh, Akif mentioned. There's the issue from the side of the government as it pertains to resources and logistics. And then there's also the aspect of policies. In fact, some of the health workers I've spoken to, some are leaving not because of the money. Some of, we can't match the money definitely, but we can do something to improve it. But it goes just beyond the remuneration. People are being frustrated in their jobs because they don't have the tools, the right tools to work with. I know somebody who lost his patients because they didn't have simple thrombolytic drugs to address like those issues. So then those are some of the challenges that should be looked at. And then there's also the issue of policy. Do we have proper health policies in place to administer good healthcare system? Yes, so Joy, I think these are also some of the issues contributing to the departure, not just the remuneration. Thank, thank you. you, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, my closing remarks would be um, certainly just like the African Union, there's a kind of Africa we want. We want to see a better Africa and undeniably impact investing is a way to go, especially like concerning how to address the SDG3, we talked about uh, improving wellness generally. So for me, uh, I hope to see more stakeholder collaborations. Uh, the Global Impact Investing Network said they've observed a lot of um, companies moving towards more collaboration with impact investors. So I'm hoping that uh, governments in Africa, impact funds in Africa can take advantage and align with these companies seeking such um, impact, social impact. And then again, there's also the policy advocacy, more and more policy advocacy, telling our story, not just telling our story, but telling the mm. right story, which is why we have the Africa Advantage magazine, to help us tell the exact story, to benefit from impact in investing. And then again, there's also a, a way to be able to tell our story using the right data. So then again, GIIN, which is the Global Impact Investing Network, said they are sitting on AUM of over one, uh, three, 1.6 trillion. So there's, they are the, the, months, the monies are there, the funds are there, but how are we going to like use our data to tell the right stories to be able to access those funds? And then again, there's also local partnerships. So I believe uh, not just waiting for funds from outside, but then institutions within the African continent can come and partner together to venture into several impact courses and then also long-term commitment as well. Like happy to say that I, I was very glad about the Transform Health Fund, which was instituted right after the US um, Africa summit that was held uh, last year. And so, yes, we want such long-term commitments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Uh, over to Eddie. Eddie, quick one. You said you had a quick comment on creative sectors. Just make it brief as we move to Korea and then we do the launch. Thank you. Zach, Zach, I have like five points and you've added a six. So I don't know how I can do it in the <laughs> let, me, have let me let me three minutes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, let me let me start with what I keep mission on governance, uh, which is uh, which, which is one of Africa's biggest scene, I think. Um and just to add to that, also governance at uh, at a business level. Because I think most of our businesses are family-founded businesses, so they do lack in areas of governance and how to transition to institutional investors. I think that's one of the well, biggest challenges we have. We're going to see more SMEs in on the continent attract capital. So addressing just adding that component there as well to what Akif mentioned. Um, the other thing I want to quickly mention too is the need for one of the, if we have high net worth um, individuals in Africa, one of the challenges I, I think I get is they also behave like entrepreneurs. 
Because for me, the, one of the key gaps if we're going to push forward the impact investment narrative is to see local mobilization of investment. How can we see uh, more Africans investing in African businesses and Afri African sectors and investing in the right places uh, with good intentions? So how can we mobilize? And that also speaks to the need for building stronger capital markets that can that are not just um, a, a, a West blueprint, but build markets that resonate with your current ecosystem and adopt systems that can increase savings and uh, available uh, local resource that can invest in some of the sectors that uh, that needs this, that, that need this kind of financing. So Africa, like um, what it was mentioned in the beginning, we need to also see ourselves uh, play that key role of investing in our own uh, uh, spaces. We every time you see new businesses coming up, so we need to see more investments instead of instead of just starting new businesses. Let's invest in more uh, existing businesses, especially from the high net worth individuals. Um, and lastly, to the issue of uh, creatives, because that's a big space uh, right now in Africa, and how we can really tap into the creative spaces is going to be a key uh, thing for us. And it's a very rewarding uh, space for investors. It's a question of understanding and structuring the right kind of approach to support the creative industry. Uh, from across uh, fabric and and clothing to those different sectors in sports and in art, uh, visual art, graphics. We need to see more investment also going into that because a lot of your, our young people um, are working in that space. And uh, we've seen good models in Uganda, the likes of Motif that are working with young people and have designed a way of how to provide materials and equipment to see that more creative businesses are coming up. Thank but, you. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you. Did, did I use three minutes? I hope it was I three. think I think you really tried. Okay. Over to you, Kuria, so that we can uh, go to Frank and we close this. Okay, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I think uh, as in closing, um, I would say that creating demonstration use cases is is a very important step in 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 my opinion to push um, this narrative and and kind of get buying from others, and so that then they can see um, that yes, indeed, there is a case for this. The the other bit that I wanted to say is uh, providing an enabling environment definitely very closely related to governance is one key one. We saw quite a huge, even uptick, for example, of mobile money, just by Uganda government's change, allowing refugees, for example, to register for SIM cards using their own um, refugee IDs. Um, and so some of these things that um, have, have that, that have been impacting on, on, on investors are, are quite key. Taxation is another one. The ability of um, uh, and and creating incentives is is another within the the, the, the national government. Uh, how can can this enabling environment be improved? How people get money into an economy? Uh, like we were saying, this is not just uh, local funds, but also looking at uh, sourcing for funds from from elsewhere. And so the ability of people to be able to actually get out their capital if they need to is, is also a key one. And then the first, the last one is really um, looking at the innovation ecosystem and uh, looking at all challenges as opportunities uh, for a solution to be, to be made. And uh, just to echo uh, Eddie's point, uh, looking and to tap on the creatives in the, in the, in the, in the continent and how they can come up with solutions to some of the challenges that Africa is facing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, it's been a wonderful contribution uh, from our writers slash panelists, and uh, you've shared with us some really good insights and perspectives, which we believe will help us in shaping this narrative further. So without further ado, I would like to welcome uh, the chief ed editor of the magazine, uh, Dr. Frank Aswani, to take the moment and uh, 
launch the Africa Advantage Magazine Volume 1. Frank, yeah. over to you. Thank you, Zach. I think one of the exciting things about doing this magazine is that I've got a new title now, Chief Editor, one that I'd never probably have gotten if I was living my usual life. Uh, but but thank you so much for this uh, and to, the, to, to our contributors and speakers. Uh, we're really grateful once again, and I can't wait for us to unpack this a bit more. Um, uh, and, and as I was listening to all of you talk and, and tied back to the theme of the magazine, the Africa's Advantage, you know, Kuria, as we're talking, and Akif, as we're talking about, you know, who is the most difficult person to design social financial services for? It has to be a refugee. Okay, this person has no address. They're moving all the time. Uh, and how do you design innovative financing mechanisms that can help meet that person's needs and bring them into, uh, make them more included into the economy? And, and Kuria, a big advantage um, that that brings to us is whatever we learn could be used globally, for example, um, to uh, support people like the isolated indigenous tribes in Canada and Australia who live in isolation in the middle of nowhere. Um, and this is the advantage we bring in this space, for example. Uh, and I always say this, whatever works in Africa is globally scalable because we offer the extremes of conditions under which these innovations are tested. Whatever works in Africa is globally scalable. So what we're doing is in essence, God's work, okay? We should be super proud of the work that we're doing and no one is blessed to have the kind of sandbox or lab to test all these innovations than those who live in the continent. So this is a blessing for us. Many Americans and many other people would die for the kind of challenges we have, which 15, 15 20 years ago were embarrassing uh, things to talk about today, the exciting impact opportunities. We're truly blessed to be on this continent with the opportunities we have to solve really um, important problems that will benefit not just our people, but the world at large. So as you guys were talking about all the things, you know, Eddie, uh, you were talking about the, the assumption of how to design models that work, uh, but it's also about how, how do we design models that work for us? When investors come to Africa, they don't come with the models that have worked in their countries. They come and plug into our proven models. Uh, so, but those same models, once again, could not only work for us, but could work for similar people in Asia, Latin America, where things like genderless investing challenges are pretty much the same. Um, so all the stuff that we've been talking about, uh, Diana, we talk about the global workforce uh, in healthcare. It's just not in healthcare. Tech, for example, our youth dividend gives us huge advantage in providing the next level of tech workers in the world. So we, we just offer some really exciting things. And, and that's why, for me, we're probably the most privileged in, impact community anywhere in the world. So let's make sure we make it count. Uh, as a community, as a population of people, as those of us on the front line, creating demonstration models, demonstrating proofs of impact, we're truly in a blessed po position. And what this magazine will try and do is see how we can enhance and showcase some of these innovations that are happening on the continent and, and not only um, attract capital for the good of the people on, in Africa, but also contribute to the greater good of the body of knowledge in the world. And when you think about Africa as a net, as a net contributor, don't just think about money. In this world, you're thinking about the treaties, treasure, time, and talent. We are also um, giving our time in, in, the, in driving some of these innovations and the talent that can then be used to scale some of these things abroad. So as we're talking about not just exporting our talent of nurses and all of you, some of the things those of you who are working in these interesting innovations should be exporting your talent to show other people in the world how this can be done in other geographies. So I really want to showcase us as a platform um, of, of greatness, uh, a hub of impact, a hub of innovation um, that the world has yet to really fully benefit from. So, so, so this is this is very exciting. So, what are you going to look for forward to in this magazine? It's going to have the following sections, as you can see on the slide in front of you. Um, something about the impact perspective, um, uh, and we'll talk about that in a short while. Uh, we've done some work on the Africa's impact investing landscape, uh, so you'll see some of the findings we got from that particular piece and on what is changing, emerging, uh, what are the trends. Uh, you'll see articles from each of the speakers that um, have been featured uh, in, the, in the call today and others who are not present today. Um, you have some uh, an article also that talks about some of the investment opportunities. And we've had an interview with Ojoma Chai, who also contributes an article on the creative space um, uh, that will speak to that. But specifically, before I officially formally launch a magazine on the impact perspective, uh, I do want to talk about what this means. So um, uh, Zanatul, your question was totally pertinent in saying, 
How does the magazine help highlight, for example, the local investment opportunities? And you're totally correct. In our view of the continent, Africa is not one country. So when we take each of these articles, or each of these sector opportunities, we've got to take them down to understand what does this mean for our respective regions, for our respective countries. Um, and to help that, we've, we've unpacked this magazine into additional activities. So it's more than just a publication. So what will follow next? We'll have expert-led webinars. So each of these uh, contributors to this, uh, of articles to this magazine will have an independent webinar, which will be held a month apart, where they'll unpack the articles in a bit more detail. So you'll have a chance to come and interrogate Kuria or Eddie or Akif or Dana or, uh, or Joma or Dr. Gidinji on, on the article in a bit more detail. Uh, that will give you um, a chance to really deep dive into some of the, the insights that they bring to the surface through the articles. And then to help this, and especially, Zanot, to your question, how do we take this to the ground so that we not only translate this? So if a Joma's article probably had a bit of a West Africa lens or spin, what does the creative sector opportunity mean in South Africa? So you look at Nigeria, for example, the creative is a lot of Nollywood and the music is doing really well. Africans, musicians today are filling stadiums that we had never imagined and venues that we never imagined they would fill. You go to India, there's, there's Bangra versions of, uh, of uh, Rema's song, uh, Come Down. You know, it's truly a great time to be an African today. But what does that mean for South Africa? What does a creative sector opportunity mean for East Africa? To consolidate and get and unpack those in a bit more detail so we can bring this up to the surface for AVPA to help connect with investors, we need to have those conversations on the ground. So each of our regional directors uh, in East Africa, uh, Nazri, who's just joined us, really glad to have her, Tochoku in West Africa and in South Africa, um, will we'll be hosting convenings. So please plug, uh, uh, connect with us. We're going to be having monthly convenings where we unpack each of these articles after the webinars have been done to see, okay, what does this mean for our local region? What is the nuance? What are the nuances that we have to talk to um, that make us uniquely with the opportunities that we present? So that kind of stuff will follow. And then we commit to taking some of those insights that come from the ground back to uh, a global investor engagement process. Uh, but the whole purpose, once again, is can we position Africa as an impact capital destination? Uh, how can we as a community make sure that we are not only leveraging the, the Pan-African perspective, but also we bring in the regional nuances through the engagement process that we've laid out? Uh, and we hope to continue with this uh, particular en en engagement through with you over time. But so I'd, it's a real pleasure for me um, uh, once again to uh, formally launch this magazine. Uh, Abby, if you can, please put a link in the chat. Um, we'd really appreciate your feedback. Uh, we'd appreciate your reading the magazine, your contribution. Uh, and for people who want to engage with this magazine even in a, in a more um, long-term way as a sponsors, uh, we, are, we are welcoming sponsors to partners in this magazine uh, to help us create better reach, greater impact. Uh, so there will be uh, opportunities for sponsors to come on board and, and be part of the magazine in, in a more longer term partnership. So we are super excited about this. So we highly encourage you now you can download the magazine and share it as widely as you want through your networks. We, if anyone of you needs a WhatsApp version as well, I'm sure you can do that from the link. Others to get in touch with us. But we're super excited to be here today and uh, we wish you happy reading. But hopefully this stimulates you to to do something. This is part of our demonstration that this is your network. And come back to us with suggestions of things we can do together, uh, uh, contributions you want to make, and engagements you want to drive. If you want to host some of these monthly convenings that we have around these articles, please let us know uh, as well. We're always looking for venues to house a couple of people to have these conversations. If you want to, to contribute to a particular sector-specific opportunity or so on and so forth, we are very open to this kind of stuff. So thank you so much. Zach, back to you. Thank, oh, you. thank you, Frank. Thank you. I'll, I'll hand it over to Abu. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Frank. And thank you very much, Zach. Um, as someone says in our Impact Investing Fellowship, there's never enough time. Uh, clearly, there was never enough time for today's session. Uh, just as you download the magazine, I'm going to take one or two minutes to just run through a couple of things. Um, Abby, if you can go through to the next slide, uh, the previous slide quickly. Uh, Frank mentioned um, sponsorship opportunities for the magazine. As you said earlier, and as you mentioned during the uh, membership launch, AVPA is your network. So is this magazine. So as 
the, the contributors and participants in today's panel made this possible. We are also opening it up to more uh, partnerships. So if you are or you feel like in the position to partner with us financially, um, we have exciting sponsorship opportunities. And this is a sample of the sponsorship benefits you get out of the publication um, and, and sponsoring the publication and our supportive uh, programming. Um, and then quickly, we are currently taking applications for a program called Africa Climate Investing Program. If you go to our website, um, avpa.africa forward slash, forward slash leadership, you will find uh, the additional details for this. We close um, the intake uh, in the second week of January and we kick off the program at the very end of January. So please take a look and apply if this applies to you. Otherwise, on behalf of everyone um, on this call and everyone who's them you're going to see on the magazine and everyone who contributed and everyone who's going to read, send us feedback and contribute in future. I'd like to welcome, first of all, to welcome future contributions. My colleague Abby is going to share a link to a form in the chat, but we're also going to email it. If you're willing to contribute to the magazine, please fill it and we'll be in touch. Otherwise, Thank you very much, and is going to evolve into on the continent. Have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Abu. Thank you so much, Fred.